and thanks to the panel in advance for uh, coming together and talking about some of the things that uh, are really interesting and important uh, when we work on the CRO uh, biotech and pharma interface. Um, so uh, when we were meeting with as a steering committee uh, talking about some of the topics that would be of most interest to this group, um, something that kept coming up was the sort of changing CRO uh, CMO landscape. And so from that we sort of devised this panel to talk about how that affects uh, different players in this space. Um, and so one of the purposes of the panel as it's constructed is to cover some of the different areas and different types of companies and how it, how it um, changes the way that we do business. So, uh, so I work at Biogen, so a relatively large uh, biotech and pharma company. Um, and we have Helen here from uh, TCR Squared, and so she'll be representing the smaller uh, biotech pharma company. Uh, Peter Meltzer from Organics, um, and so he'll be representing the smaller CRO, and then and Joe Sinclair from Wuji, um, so he'll be uh, representing the larger CRO. So we try to get spread across these groups, and we'll, we'll try and make sure we cover um, both what our companies are like, and then just generally try and represent our, uh, our industry and, and some of the excitements and concerns that we have with the changing CRO, CMO landscape. So I'll start by giving uh, each of the panel members a, a chance to introduce themselves. So Helen. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Helen Ho. Um, as uh, Evan mentioned, I'm the head of corporate development at TCR Square Therapeutics. We are a young startup company uh, started by MPM Capital, focusing on developing novel T-cell therapies uh, for solid tumors, a very exciting field uh, today. Prior to joining TCR Squared, I was at Agios Pharmaceuticals for almost six years, where I led licensing as well as uh, development of a number of different creative deal structures with our CRO partners and managed the alliance there to make sure that we are living through the deal, um, streamlining and integrating the uh, different groups. You know, having been as small companies, um, I really do come to appreciate the leverage, the flexibility and expertise that our CRO partners uh, provide us um, to allow us to advance our programs. I also appreciate the, the uh, strategic um, uh, uh, plans and uh, considerations that go behind it and how that um, may change and evolve as our company grow and become more complex. So I look forward to sharing with you some of the experiences and insight that I have uh, with you today. Um, I'm Peter Meltzer. I'm a founder of Organics along with uh, uh, three partners. Uh, Organics was established some 31 years ago, uh, which has flown by like uh, lightning, but be that as it may. In brief, we provide synthetic organic chemistry services. We participate in programs aimed towards the development of new therapeutic agents. We are located in Woburn, uh, in Woburn, Mass in a state-of-the-art facility which we built specifically for synthetic organic chemistry. We own and operate that facility. Our building houses some uh, 40 uh, hoods, all equipped with all, uh, uh, all functions uh, to operate in a, a chemistry environment. Um, we have a, a fully and comprehensively equipped uh, laboratories. And uh, our focus is synthesizing anything from straightforward compounds that are known in the literature to complex compounds which are either designed by us in collaboration with our clients or uh, are entered into a program which is a structure activity relationship program where we are seeking out lead compounds on behalf of our clients. Um, I think that's a once over lightly of what we are, so I'll pass the baton. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. Uh, Joe Sinclair, I'm a strategic account manager for Wuxi Aptek in our global business operations. Um, seven years within the organization and have seen uh, really growth and development of Wuxi from a mid-sized CRO into a, a commercial uh, large entity in, in the space. Um, much growth and development in the organization comes through uh, continued reinvestment in capabilities, uh, technologies, and capacities across a number of different verticals within industry. So uh, Wuxi is positioned as an organization to really um, drive drug development and clinical and commercial production across small molecule R&D, uh, biologics, meaning a number of different recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, cell and gene therapy programs, 
uh, as well as a business supporting medical device testing and recent engagements in uh, genomics and molecular diagnostics. Uh, seven years with the organization, as I had mentioned, mainly working in the business development and marketing-centric functions uh, for a company. Currently within my role today, I'm supporting our global top 20 large pharma, so working on strategic multi-year collaborations and, and partnership, uh, really selling from a program perspective and, and trying to build strong relations in that regard. Um, I've spent a number of years also working with the local Boston Life Sciences community, uh, selling to a number of startups and mid-sized companies, as well as large pharma in this area. So, I uh, have witnessed uh, growth of the organization and a lot of different perspectives in terms of customer interaction and uh, needs in, in market. I appreciate the opportunity of being here today. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you all. So, yeah, so I have a few questions that I'll, I'll uh, pass on to the panel members and then uh, I'd like to open it up to questions from the audience pretty soon after that. So if you guys are um, thinking of ways that you want to probe this group for some of our experiences in these different uh, areas of expertise. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those very shortly. So I did want to start, um, Peter, you uh, predate this, your, your company predates the Mass Bio Symposium by 25 years, so <laughs> clearly you saw something coming before it came. So um, maybe you can give us a little history of your, your view of, of the CRO and CMO landscape in Massachusetts over the last 30 years. Well, yeah, I can give you some uh, background of the early days because I think it's quite informative and quite interesting in a sense. Um, at the time that we began to offer services uh, in synthetic organic chemistry in uh, Boston, uh, there was no market for that. And the reason for that is because uh, there were only large pharma companies, none of which actually existed in the Boston area whatsoever. And uh, small pharma had not even been thought of at that stage. So we did uh, what everybody advises you not to do, and that is start a company for which there was no marketplace. <laughs> um, it turned out that things changed radically. And actually, I, I just realized around the table down there that there's a company that started very much the same time as we did, too, Recirca, within actual uh, months of, of one another. And uh, so I was very interested to hear that. So there were two pioneers, if you like. I used to th think it was only uh, one pioneer, but there were two pioneers. Um, so um, we are, uh, uh, as I say, 30 years old. And the whole landscape has changed tremendously. As everyone knows, you look around Boston and there are myriad small companies, there are myriad uh, virtual companies, and of course every large farmer has a presence in the area. So it's night and day from 30 years ago uh, to now. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, we were one of the first companies to do this, and the question is, you know, how did you get any clients? Because at that stage, large pharma, as I you know, recall and mentioned, large pharma was very wary of entrusting their favorite compounds and programs to some unknown entity. So uh, we were actually very fortunate. Our first clients were Alcon Labs, uh, now uh, bought by Novartis recently, and we were with them, or they were with us for some 20 something years. Um, and then our other first uh, client was Burroughs Welcome. And they were with us for uh, some great period of time. And then slowly, of course, new clients arrived, faster than we thought it would happen, given that there was no real marketplace. Um, our original space was in uh, uh, Cummings Properties here, and I heard from somebody else, and there are many people in here actually who have space in Cummings Properties, and that worked well for us, but we did, as uh, I think uh, I'm made aware, we did uh, purchase land, built a state-of-the-art facility, and that's where we are to this day. Um, right now, of course, there are many, many more opportunities besides organics. I, I sound like I'm selling for another company, but anyhow, <laughs> besides organics for uh, getting hold of services that range all the way from synthetic organic chemistry to medchem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that's a little bit of a background. Yeah, excellent. Okay. 
Thank you. So yeah, so the first question I'd like to open up to the whole group here is um, one of the things that we sort of talked about in, in our phone calls is, you know, how do you structure your arrangements and with, with clients, especially your more strategic clients, to make sure that the partnership you know, benefits both of you and, and that you align your incentives between your company and, and then your customer or your partner. Mm -hmm. So maybe Helen, we can start with you. Yeah, so there are a couple of types of arrangement that we think of when we're working with CRO partners. One is the traditional fee for service and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then the other <coughs> one that I thought has been really helpful for a small company, especially when you have limited budget is to do something like a, a milestone-based uh, arrangement where you may be able to get a lower upfront uh, but pay for success, uh, so a much bigger milestone. And so that has been a, <coughs> another attractive um, uh, structure for us and in a certain, in certain aspect it aligns uh, the incentives as well as the goal of what you're trying to achieve. And so, from a, a traditional fee-for-service type of model, I think one thing that I think have been worked well is, for me, provide enough flexibility to the contract as possible. So by that, what, you know, I'll give you an example where in working with an animal models facility, my scientists had to basically track down all the itemized items um, which we could be, get charged for, including when you get animal dose, either during the regular hours or off hours. And so I think those things slow science down, and that's something that we don't want to put into the structure of any agreement. So really go into detail with our CRO partners to understand the specifics of the, the science and make sure that there's enough flexibility within the structure so the science really the scientists really focus on what needs to really get the right experiments done instead of dealing with the back-end accounting uh, logistics um, and on the the milestone based structure you know I think again as I mentioned this aligns the incentives but again recognizing that it does take a lot more time to get this type of deals done right because for a small company you are focusing on you're focusing on a broader milestone or goals for your project and the CRO is only typically focused on one aspect of that project and so how do you and the CRO partners align around what that milestone should be, what is the value of that milestone and also how do you make sure the CRO partners are comfortable with the, the risk that of the program for which they do not have control over and so those are a lot of very complicated a discussion that needs to needs to happen, but at the same time potentially align the incentives across uh, both, both organizations. So, how, what would you say when when you're when you're coming up with the sort of non-traditional contracts to to make sure that both companies are are benefiting the right way from the work? Do you feel like there's a difference between some of the smaller companies where where maybe you know you're a bigger percentage of their business, especially as a small company versus the large CROs? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, for a bigger company and company like Ushi who has been investing in companies as, as well as have, have the capital to really invest uh, for the long run, I think those type of conversations is typically uh, easier and I think they're a little bit more willing to give up the near term uh, uh, um, revenues and in, in, in the hope of building the company for the long run. Uh, and so I think those type of concept is easier to have a discussion around with the bigger CROs. Having said that, I, you know, over the years, I see smaller CRO partners also moving towards that direction with the, the vision of becoming more innovative, uh, starting to have their own pipeline down the road. And so they see company like mine as a good training ground, if you will, for them to learn how to do the discovery and development work uh, in their geographies. Perfect, thanks. Uh, Joe, do you wanna? Sure, wanna sure. Helen spoke here. a lot about milestones and, and deal structure. Um, coming at it from a slightly different perspective and strength of partnership from a, a customer to a CRO, how do you set up a framework to really establish strong grounds to have a successful program? So. Uh, what I found is a lot of that really happens upfront in establishment 
of good communication channels, actually getting into your CRO service provider, meeting them, meeting their, their staff, um, the scientific expertise and leadership that are going to be hands-on and, and working with uh, your program, put them in position to support good business for you. A lot of that um, comes with clearly defining scope. Far too many times we've witnessed scope creep throughout the start of a program where you think you're getting into one type of project and then three or six months down the line, um, it's, it's a much different program than you had originally anticipated. So clearly define what both party looks for up front, establish key performance indicators if they're required, um, have a good steering committee or program man management structure to manage communication on the day-to-day -day basis as well as more periodically at a higher level um, and steer the program in, in the right direction that way. I think that really leads to uh, good collaboration, good partnership um, for the CRO specifically to understand forecast and work and, and how a program will, will move forward and evolve from there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in our case, actually, our model is far more simple than, than uh, both of these, I think. We work on a fee-for-service or an FTE basis. And what determines uh, which we do is the fee-for-service is generally for uh, projects that we know are going to work, uh, even though they've not been done before, but we expect we'll get them to work with absolute certainty within a certain time frame, within a certain budget frame. And the um, FTE uh, projects are more aligned with discovery programs. And discovery programs are such that, of course, you discover new things as you go along the way. And so you cannot actually say, uh, within X months, we will have achieved Y and Z, because it's not certain. But what we do set up are very, very careful uh, agreements with our clients, which uh, state exactly what we're going to do, uh, we provide uh, in-depth proposals to back up what we use uh, an FTE for or a, a, a fee-for-service. And uh, we use that as a measure. So our clients know exactly what it is we're going to be doing for them within this contract. Um, we have outlined and developed that understanding together in a one-to-one -one exchange of what needs to be done. And in fact, we submit our uh, deal structure in a proposal to our clients for their review. And then we'll revisit issues that they might want to have revisited or will just uh, uh, like what they see and go ahead. So in short, I think our uh, modus vivendi is more simple than, than yours in, in that way. I'm not making a value judgment <laughs> here. <laughs> But uh, that has worked very well for us over the last 30-something uh, years. Thank you. Yeah, and I can speak for uh, Biogen, I think, um, at a big company. So it, what's, what's nice is, you know, your, your overall, your, your check to, to a, especially typically, like, a large CRO is going to be bigger because you have different pieces of the puzzle going on in different places. But because <coughs> of the number of people involved and, and sometimes the horizontal integration is difficult, at a, at a company from you know, research through to manufacturing. Um, it can actually be difficult to get the right players in the room to, to really connect those pieces. And so, um, yeah, there's definitely some forces pushing you. So, so a, you know, a particular business unit might be really interested in a, in a small CRO that they want to work with, with then pressure from sourcing to consolidate to some of the bigger CROs that we use. Um, so it definitely, there's definitely poses some challenges as, as far as figuring out how to be uh, create a creative and innovative relationship that spreads across groups that you don't have control over. Um, so uh, it's definitely a challenge. Um, so yeah, so with that, maybe I'll give uh, the audience a second to uh, ask questions that, that you'd like the panel to answer. I see, we have a microphone back there. It's difficult to see. This is Karen from Bionic Testing Laboratories. Just a quick question, as you approach clients, um, um, CROs generally, do you have um, um, a sense of uh, you know, their expectations in terms of conversion? What are the timelines that it takes before um, you know, some of these engagements can actually materialize? And um, you know, what's the time frame ahead of the project that you generally um, look at or that your clients come to you in case of Peter um, with? And generally speaking, you know, 
um, again, that conversion factor, how many you know, interactions do you anticipate generally? At, at which point do you give up? Um, thank sure. you. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Got it. No, I was going to say so. So um, sort of framing that, I think it would be an interesting uh, answer to see the difference between sort of the large and small CRO right. thought process on that. Um, you know, you know, I would imagine that Wuji has more flexibility as a big organization to to deal with the maybe a slower um, runway of a of a program getting started. Um, but then at the same time, you know, maybe not the. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So, so maybe Peter, I'll let you start with sort of thinking um, about that. Yeah, um, no, I hear what you're saying there. So if I understood this co correctly, um, I think it speaks to uh, how efficiently we can actually begin and set up and get things rolling. Is that it in a nutshell? Um, I, from my experience, I think as a smaller company, we can be more nimble. Um, we don't have the hierarchical structure of a larger company which has to decide on A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we, in our case, in fact, uh, uh, my partners and I sit in a room and uh, we figure out how to get this client's uh, job done uh, as soon as possible and with our usual attention to detail and so forth. Um, I don't know if that begins to address what you were saying, but that is, that's how we've looked at our programs coming in. So Does that address it? <laughs> so Peter, but so so I guess the uh, I, I think I, part of the question was you know how do you how how nimble are you for for projects that are going to fail and how do you how are you able to sort of deal with that and convey that message of you know this is not going to work I, I mean well, maybe maybe you only have a couple examples of that over thirty one years but but maybe yeah, you can speak well more. you know I don't know it sounds like it's self serving I guess what I'm going to say now. <laughs> But uh, I think we've made 99% of our projects uh, work. All right. Um, and my colleagues here can uh, attest to that or not, as they like. But, but so we haven't uh, encountered that problem. On, on some occasions, yes, we hit a brick wall, and then that would be discussed with the client, and, and we would offer suggestions how we overcome this brick wall. But uh, it would be their call, their call then to say, well, let's go ahead or let's not go ahead because it doesn't look like it's possible. But uh, part of our strengths uh, in what we do is that we are staffed primarily by people with PhDs and extensive experience. And more than that, on our own staff, we've got people that have been with us for the life of the company. And so there's a huge knowledge base which allows us to solve problems of real complexity. Um, and then we've had research programs of our own which contributes to that ability to solve substantial problems that have occurred in really tricky uh, er areas. So, uh, as I say, it sounds self-serving, but I think it's true. <laughs> does, that, uh, does that answer you? So, Joe, uh, yeah, so, so at Wuji, if you're going to fail, how do you make sure you fail fast? <laughs> yeah, I, I always tell customers, right, put us in position to support the service in our best light. So once you understand you're going to have a program, uh, whether it's six months out, a year out, three months out, wh whatever it is, let us know at the earliest point possible because that gets you connected with a business development manager, that gets you connected with a project manager who's going to tentatively put that on the schedule or review that in operational meetings to understand that that workflow is going to come into the lab. So a lot of it is, is managing capacity, managing your resource and headcount, and as far prior notification that you can provide as possible certainly puts your CRO, CMO in, in best light. Um, does that help to answer a little further? Yeah. And and then just well, to, oh, go ahead. Just to yeah. add to that, I think from a company's perspective, Part of the diligence is to, can you work with a CRO partner to, to, to really scope out what the project looks like and how much flexibility does your CRO partner provide in, in the change of scope throughout it, right? And be able to work with you in troubleshooting through our problems, right? And so a lot of time we will work with CRO partner as a pilot study to better understand how do we work together. And so I think that that's one really critical consideration for me. But once we get the project started as a company, you know, at least the approach that I have taken is to be extremely transparent with our CRO partners, to be to be 
as integrated as you possibly can, and so they become part of your internal team. And I think providing them with a context and have an aligned goal in where you want to achieve, allow everybody to be much more incentivized and motivated to achieving your goal. And so with that, you know, I think our team typically will focus a lot on not just the technical um, discussions of how do you get things done, but we involve our CRO partners in those brainstorming sessions. We reach out to them, you know, you, the CRO partners are not just our pair of hands, but we involve them, them in get, giving us the expertise that they have in working together. And I think that's really important, you know, not so different from, you know, how do you incentivize and working with your internal uh, teams, and, you know, it's not any different with the CRO partners, and I see a big difference when, you know, it just in terms of the mentality of how do you work together. Mm -hmm. So, how if I, I can add to that, if I may. Yeah. For us, I mean, uh, this resonates entirely with us because uh, we have a real emphasis on communication. So once we start with uh, a client, we expect to be able to speak to them on a regular basis. We expect that uh, we'll have face-to-face -face meetings if they're in the Boston area. And uh, we expect that all successes and potential failures or hurdles will be discussed when they occur with our clients so that there are no surprises for, uh, for our clients. And that's worked spectacularly well. So for our uh, clients, we invite them to join us around our conference table. We will make our scientists available to them should they want to go that way or otherwise the managers of the uh, particular projects alone and we will have in detail discussions. So the bottom line there is, as soon as we learn things about the project that we are doing that is either success or difficulties, we want our client to know. We see, our, see ourselves as a part of our client's team. That's how we view it and that's how we expect our uh, staff to view it. Have and I, sorry. May I add? Sorry? Go, finish, okay. I'm sorry, I wanted no. to add something. No, go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of defining your starting point, what, what truly is that? Because I find that there is a large amount of sometimes due diligence that also needs to be done on the front end to be able to even work with a service provider. So a company is going to want to uh, establish CDA agreements, sometimes master service agreements, quality agreements, get in for site audits, um, sometimes not just one site audit, but if they're a global facility uh, where workflows are moving site to site, there, there may be multiple site audits. That all takes sometimes a tremendous amount of time. So understanding those activities, um, the timeline to get documents through legal is, is certainly um, very, very important as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I wanna give uh, someone else a chance to... I, I, I'm Alan Herbert from Inside Bio. So my question to you, I guess this is for Evan, is just about uh, two numbers. One number is the percentage of R&D in large companies going to CROs and CMOs. And the second number is the percentage of that that's going outside the US. And I, we, we know 30 years ago that both those numbers were zero. I don't know what they are now. Uh, I'd be interested to know that. And I'd also be interested to know what the projection is for the future. Yeah, it's not zero. That's that's for sure. Um, I think I mean, typically the on the on the research and development side or research and discovery side of Biogen, it's a there's a global footprint of of CROs that that we work with. Um, my organization is on the development side, and so um, that's more the CDMO area. And um, we typically work with companies. Um, I mean, the majority of the work probably comes between the U.S. and Europe. Um, with some presence in India and China. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, I guess it depends on need. I mean, obviously there's, there's functional things like, like uh, release testing in Europe and things of that nature uh, in Japan. Um, but I think that there's, there's definitely, as, as Biogen grows and as you know, a lot of the companies grow, you sort of have to face those decisions of you know, what work that you're, that you're doing is predictable enough that you can find a partner to do it so that the scientists that you hired because they're the best in their field can focus on the next thing that is not yet predictable. Um, so, you know, if you think about a company like ours, like we have monoclonal, antibi monoclonal antibodies that, that we in the industry have been working on for a long time. Um, and then you have on the other side of that cell and gene therapies, which are obviously 
Um, you know, so how do you balance that as, as the portfolio grows? Um, and you, and you, know, you may or may not want to expand into a company the size of some of the giants. Um, and if you don't, then, then how do you leverage the, the partner network? I don't think I can give you a percentage. I'm sure my finance partner could do that for you, but um, he's not here. So, uh, <laughs> but, but I would say, I mean, just looking in within, for example, the analytical development and, and quality uh, control departments, I mean, it's, it's definitely reaching 25, 30%. And, and I think it'll grow because, you know, our portfolio is more complex than it's ever been. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so it's like you have to, where, where do we hire the world's experts and, and where do we find, uh, you know, the, the world's experts that are, that are elsewhere that we can leverage and, and so that give us that flexibility um, for work that, you know, we, we, we know enough about to, to handle it externally. I hope that sort of goes towards your question. Yeah, sure. I think we have a question over here. We'll get to you. Sorry. No, we click on Hi, I'm Heidi Schulz. My question, I think, is probably more for Helen, but all of you probably can contribute. You mentioned that there's a, a benefit, and, and I can see where there can be, when a CRO can uh, do some risk sharing with you, whether it's a direct investment or they see uh, the opportunity to uh, come up with their own assets in the future. How do you structure your contracts to avoid conflict of interest, in other words, so that all of the work product that you've paid for is yours and is not um, perhaps some of it being used as a benefit to your provider. How do you structure your contracts to ensure that? Yeah, that's always a sticking point and it really depends on the type of work that we do, right? So. And from a company perspective, um, and the same thing as you know how we structure things, there are some things that are really hard to give up. And IP is one thing, right? And then royalty is another. And so typically that's the first, to, the, the first discussion that we have just to make sure that we're aligned on that expectation, right? And so I don't think there is a right answer because if I'm on your, you know, the CRO side, I would say, you know, for the work that we've done, um, we deserve to be a co-IP author on, on the invention that we have uh, generated. Um, and I think there's definitely merit for that. But, you know, just thinking from a company's perspective, that's typically an extremely tough line to, to um, to, uh, to draw, um, especially if you have other options to go after that does not, uh, you know, um, uh, does not force you to give up the IP rights. So generally, I think it really depends on what expertise the CRO partner brings in, uh, brings to the table, and a lot of time it comes down to supply and demand and how much leverage you have. But, uh, you know, I IP is typically a very sticky issue, and so to the extent that we can avoid that we would. So Peter is a small CRO and what flexibility do you have in that space? Of well that's interesting because uh, for us we reach an agreement with our clients that all IP invented on their dime belongs to their dime, uh, to, belongs to their company and we hold no rights to it but of course the patent laws are such that any inventors have to go on that patent um, which is an, it implies that there's an ownership by organics. But we agree that although the, our inventor is on the patent, that uh, we have no financial rights, no financial claims on that whatsoever. So that has worked actually uh, very well for us. Now, admittedly, if we did have uh, fun, uh, claims on our inventions for our clients, perhaps we would do a lot better financially. <laughs> but uh, this is how our modus vivendi, quite frankly, and it has served us well. So have you had any clients that came to you and said, I can't pay you as much as you want, but I'll give you some of this IP? Has that ever? No, we, uh, we, we haven't. Maybe you will have now. <laughs> yeah, now you'll have them. Joe, do you want to chime in on uh, Wuxi's perspective? Yeah, there's a unique um, kind of perspective here with Wuxi because we've developed um, business organizations and uh, therapeutic support pl platforms which are really open access. So that allows you know uh, any company and in industry to really come and access um, technologies and IP that may not typically be accessible to them, uh, either due to financial cost or, or others. So we tried to provide the open platform that can help customers really from the earliest stages of 
uh, concept and discovery through to commercialization. Um, over the years, we've developed um, somewhat of a royalty structure in certain areas of, of our businesses, but uh, in general, we try to really remain open for all of our customers to come and to access our, our technologies. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think we have a couple other questions. Interesting discussion. My name is David Zimmerman. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Colexa. And the question I have regards uh, CRO, CMO, CDMOs who practice what I would call a mixed model, where they're not only providing service to pharmaceutical customers, but also doing their own internal research. And I think it touches on the IP question that was asked earlier. And when we founded Colexa, one of the things that Bob and I decided is we did not want to compete against our client base and made a very conscious decision to not do that so there was never a question about whether we were giving the best scientists or the best experience to our customer base. So for companies that are practicing a mixed model, how do you reconcile that with your customers? And from a customer perspective, how do you feel about companies doing their own internal research? Can I address that? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, that's extremely interesting because we fit that kind of description. So when we established or organics way back when, we uh, decided we also wanted to have an internal uh, research component for a variety of reasons. Um, we already had experience working with uh, NIH and we also, here's a, a side issue, we also actually, to be truthful, thought in the very beginning that uh, this company might not work as we want and we'll be making sodium chloride for the rest of our lives instead of some exciting new entities. And so we'd set up our own programs uh, within, and I'll tell you a tiny little bit about that, and those programs were designed to solve uh, pre pressing issues such as drug addiction, uh, such as, uh, well, we've worked in the obesity area. So, but, but what we did there in the early days is we actually applied for R01 grants. I don't know if you know the difference between R01s and others, but anyhow, R01 is an academic grant. We would be in a pool of academics. We applied for uh, R01 grants in the cannabinoid area and in the tropane area. In the tropane area, we are looking for medications for co uh, cocaine addiction. In the cannabinoid area, it was more basic research as initially. The cannabinoid era actually has continued. The tropane area uh, has not because the fundamental approach, uh, we believed eventually wouldn't work, but be that as it may. What that did for us was a number of things. We could uh, uh, find areas that would be clear for us to work within, without uh, going to a large farmer, etc., uh, being worried about what we do. So large farmer actually didn't care at that stage because they wouldn't touch cannabinoids or opioids or whatever it is we were working on. So, <coughs> but it also gave us a platform to publish. And if you look at Organics' publication list online somewhere, you'll see it's vast. And most of that comes from our own internal work funded by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, in addition, what that allowed us was uh, another great opportunity, and that is to hire at the postdoc level. I've told you already that most of our scientists have got PhDs. Some enter as postdocs. So we hire at the postdoc level, and those people uh, uh, spend time working on this particular project, whatever it is. That serves not only as a way to get these projects done exceedingly well, but it serves as a way to do a long-term interview because the postdoc position is not necessarily permanent. So we've attracted some outstanding people to work with us through mechan that mechanism. And in fact, two of our most outstanding people uh, here today came roughly through that uh, mechanism. So uh, we actually have continued that program, as I mentioned. We are still working with the federal government under a different uh, uh, mechanism now, the SBIR mechanism, which you're probably all pretty much familiar with, small business uh, mechanism. And that is working well. It's a different structure than the original R01s, which were five years. The SBIR is a small amount of time and then a larger amount of time. 
But essentially, that has uh, helped propel us forward in what we do and has made, quite frankly, our work very exciting as well. Uh, I don't know if this resonates with you guys because uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily generate the kind of dollars you might be looking for in your own programs, but it certainly generates enthusiasm and excitement for yeah, us. Yeah, no, and I, I would agree with that from the company's perspective. Mm. You know, over the years, especially I think that over the last five years, we have a lot of CRO partners who have now started to develop their new innovative programs. Mm. Mm. And I think on, on the one hand, it does, you, you can tell the change in mindset of the scientists that you're working with. They're not just there to do what they're told to do, but they are starting to think about what is the drug discovery process? Yes. How do you get it into the clinic? Once you're in the yes. clinic, what are the translational work that you need to do? Mm -hmm. And so having the expertise and having CRO partners that are start to, starting to hire veterans in the industry mm -hmm. that have experience to do that, definitely helps with us and the work that we are doing with the CRO <coughs> partners. Mm -hmm. And in my previous company, we have also benefited from the, the innovative pipeline that our CRO partner has generated and so mm -hmm. far to license some of those assets from uh, CROs. Um, and these are things that you know, they have started uh, themselves initially and then we license um, over and have the ability once we license to to work with them on those projects I think makes a lot of sense and really benefited mm -hmm. us so I don't really see a conflict of interest to, to your point there as long as when you start a project and we always check to make sure that the target that we're going to be working on does not overlap with some of the work that they are already doing internally mm -hmm. then otherwise mm -hmm. I think it's a win-win. Yeah, Your point about the licensing opportunity is well taken because uh, we have licensed uh, uh, material that's come out of our federally funded uh, uh, projects and uh, that has been actually quite exceptional. Okay. It's not how we set out but uh, we made discoveries that were worth uh, something or other to somebody that's who would right. like to license that's it. Right. So Joe, I know uh, Uji gave us a, a webinar maybe today on, <laughs> on a technology to, to manufacture lentiviral and AAV based sure. gene therapy. So, so that, that, that's I think a pretty good example for the question of something that Wuji's developed mm -hmm. um, that you know maybe in, you would think like oh that's that would be something that like the, the innovator company would have developed and, right. and now you're uh, allowing your customers to take advantage of that. So maybe you can talk a little bit about. Again, the, these are open access platform technologies. This is mainly in the space of um, uh, commercial <laughs> manufacturing or clinical manufacturing support. So that type of arrangement, um, we try to be an open access platform company. So you can come in and we will structure a service contract around access to that platform um, for production of the product. And really the, the arrangement stops there. We're not signing agreements or we're not tying ourselves to uh, royalties for sale of product once that's once that's in market. Um, the organization has had a number of clinical and, and late phase collaborations which would go uh, potentially commercial but we try to structure our agreements where we're not taking essentially a piece of the pie once it, once it gets to that setting. Uh, that's to remain um, impartial to that discussion to really be in, in position to just be a service provider. We're not here to be in the therapeutics development realm. We want to have capabilities and capacities end to end, soup to nuts, to be able to support uh, customers in a number of therapeutic classes and disease states, but we ourselves are not looking to compete. We're here solely to provide service. Terrific. Another question? Hi, I'm Kathy McKenna, uh, Intertech Pharmaceutical Services, uh, White House, New Jersey. Um, so it's more for the uh, kind of pharma biotech companies, so, you know, more the uh, Biogens and the, and the Helens group. Um, can you just explain how either a large or small um, company decides on whether to pick a partner in a large, you know, either is it a large CRO or a CMO that like, okay, I'm just going to pick a large one, or uh, should I pick a small to mid-sized one? And maybe what thought process goes into that? So is it reputation? Is it you just meet somebody? You know, how does that process work? Yeah, I start by, if they're not here, then forget it. <laughs> 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 no. <laughs> um, so I, I would say, I mean, it's, 
at a big company, like a lot of things, I think it can be a bit of a moving target depending on, um, and so we get tied in. So especially for big CROs, um, where, where there's like a clinical aspect too. So that's not the field that I'm in, but if we have those big contracts um, and establish relationships with a big CRO on that side, that could be a very lucrative contract. And so, so not taking advantage of that could be a disadvantage. But, um, but at the same time, I think, you know, on the, at least on the development and quality side, I mean, we're scientists, so we wanna to talk to scientists at these companies and feel like they understand us, communication's gonna go well, they, that they're, you know, gonna be able to understand maybe some of the things that we say, like everything from acronyms to just sort of what, you know, the biogenized language of how we, how we communicate our science. So, so for us, that's really important. And then, and then so, that's, so that's one of the things that pushes us in a direction. Of course, cost is another, because when it comes down to it, we need to, you know, we're gonna get a budget and, and we're gonna get less done if, it, if it's more expensive. And then the third is just, you know, the, the sort of sourcing group and, and sort of the, whatever the um, incentives that they have from their uh, organization. So, so you sort of mix those together. So, you know, if you, we work very closely with our sourcing groups, but I've, I've heard at other large pharma companies, they can be even more sort of separated. And so you come up with a great idea and then you get like hidden roadblocks. Um, and so, yeah, so it definitely is difficult. And, and I think it's just a matter of knowing the right players so that everyone who, who feeds into the decision is there and figuring out what it is like the value proposition of spending, whether it's spending a little bit more or maintaining an extra relationship to get the service level that you're looking for. I mean, because frankly, I mean, it's hard to tell that to someone whose job it is to save the company money. But if you say like, I'm gonna spend three times as much of my time trying to get this going, if we work with a company that's either far away or, or just doesn't have that technical expertise, but has that better price. And I, in my experience, Biogen has been very good about understanding the needs of the scientists. Um, other companies, it may be more difficult, but I think it's just getting those right opinions in the room. I don't know, Helen, you can speak to that. Yeah, no, CCR I think those Square. are, I mean, if cost is a problem for you, then you can imagine it's a big problem for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, for us, obviously technical expertise is really important, but because we're a small company, because we don't have deep pocket, a lot of time we understand that by working with smaller and younger companies, and as long as we think they're the people that we can train them or help them grow, right, and, and, and uh, establish their expertise, we're actually willing to do that. And so my last company, you know, we actually spend a lot of effort in you know, transferring the protocol over to them. Uh, we, we work with them really closely to make sure that we are actually helping them to establish their expertise and uh, their capabilities. And we're willing to do that in exchange for our time. And, um, and a lot of time, I think we also lean towards smaller companies because they are more flexible in working with us in something more creative, or they are more willing to work with us on certain pilot studies uh, first before you know, committing a really big amount of money there. And so there's certainly an advantage to, to that in a small company in addition to just um, you know, having a little bit more hands-on time with the management of the small company. Not that you know, we, don't, we wouldn't get that with Wuxi mm -hmm. and the, the big folks there, but you know, inevitably you would run into troubles or in, and issues in your, in your studies. And so the question for us and the most important question is, who do you go to who is going to return your call and say, I am on it. I'm fully accountable. We will get this done and solve the problem as soon as you can. How do, how do you balance risk then with placing business with an organization which is more end-to-end -end, uh, versus diversification of the number of vendors you're using? Um, we understand a, a large CRO can provide value. Um, they can integrate a number of activities and service areas, mm -hmm. hopefully to save you time and money at the end of the day. How do you balance yeah. that versus the risk of placing yeah, business it's a, with Yeah, it's a really great question, and I think it comes down to understanding what are our own strengths and what are the gaps that needs to be filled by uh, CRO, right? And so if these are something that we know how to do, we just need to have more hands and more FTs to do, then I'm not so worried about needing the expertise of the CRO to come in and fill that. But if I know that this is the gap that I have, 
and that I definitely the expertise of either a small or a big CRO company to come in and fill it, then technical expertise and the ability for them to help me troubleshoot through mm -hmm. that is going to be the most important uh, consideration in that, uh, in, for that project. Yeah, I think that's especially important, and I know TCR Squared is a cell therapy company, and so, you know, in these new modalities where, where you may find, like, one or two CROs that you can really right. rely on to have that expertise, because where do they, I mean, where else, where are they going to get it? So maybe a university that's working on it, or people coming from a company that's working on it and, and moving to a CRO. It's, it, you know, it can be difficult to, to build a lot of that um, expertise. I, I know Wuji has a lot of expertise in the gene therapy area, but frankly, there's, def, there's still risk because there's not a huge amount of companies. I think that will change, but yeah. not a huge amount of companies in that space. So it's, Absolutely. it's so that, that's a consideration. You say, well, I think we should make sure we build that internally as well, because if we, if we move into a, a situation where we don't want to have that relationship anymore, where do we go? Yeah, right. and that's really interesting. I think from a CMO side, for cell therapy, it's a, a question that we asked at TCR Squared uh, ourselves of, you know, one day in the future when we need, a, you know, bigger c clinical supply or commercial supply, can, is the CMO landscape going to grow so much that we can rely on CMO to do all that manufacturing as we have in small molecules or biologics, or is this something that we have to build ourselves, um, very much like how Novartis, Juno, and uh, Kite have done in the past. So that's something that we're trying to figure out, and it'll yeah. be really interesting to see how all of that evolves. Absolutely. Can I ask an unrelated question of, sure. of us? Um, <laughs> Uh, what do you think has been the impact of the changes in Asia, in China and India, in competing for CRO, CMO projects in the U.S.? Yeah, I have actually worked with a number of uh, CROs in, in Asia, Asian countries, mm. and typically it's been very attractive for the lower FTE rates, yes. um, as well as the flexibility that they have there, and, you know, good expertise uh, there. Um, I think over the years, um, what is also attractive is that they have been hiring expats from who has been trained in the U.S. over there, yeah, industry yeah. veterans, and mm -hmm. that helped us to you know, have a partner, a soft mm -hmm. partner, to troubleshoot through, uh, shoot through that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the challenge is huge in terms of working with people with different language barrier and mm -hmm. cultural differences. And, and time difference. And time difference. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when I can work with a partner, just uh, down the road and have that face-to-face -face interaction, mm -hmm. it's invaluable. And so yeah, it's, yeah. A very, it's a very tough yeah. uh, decision. And also for a co from a company perspective, it's really important for me to have uh, scientists and program managers who know how to have that leadership and yeah. uh, communication skills to work through that when you don't see each other all the time. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like we, I, I really appreciate your guys' perspective on this. Uh, and we talked a lot about um, some of the differences in working with small and large CROs and some of the concerns we have moving into, into new therapeutic areas and new uh, discovery spaces. Um, and talked about generally the right ways to maintain relationships and align incentives um, between companies. Um, I don't know if we want to give everyone a, a one last yeah. minute to. Yes, please. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, maybe we could just go down the line and if there's any. Uh, last thoughts that each person has on the on the CRO landscape. Starting from yeah, myself. go ahead, Joe. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, again, I will uh, I will be here for the next uh, few hours. So if anybody wants to have a more direct one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, happy happy to do so. Uh, again, appreciate to the Mass Bio Council an invitation today to speak on the panel. Appreciate everyone's time as well and listening in here today. Um, last thoughts, really structuring good, sound, solid communication and discussions with your CRO. Have those discussions up front. Understand what you want out of the relationship. Understand fully what your CRO or CDMO uh, can provide to you. A lot of it comes down to due diligence um, prior to projects kicking off, prior to you moving into a program with, with that, that vendor or that provider. So. Uh, really focus in on that that starting ground, that early stage of the relationship, because that's what builds long-standing and strong relationships down the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, for a start, thank you very much for putting this together and for the invitation to participate. Um, 
I guess I have two colleagues, which I, I can no, not see any faces here because of the lights, but anyway, who are somewhere out here. Two colleagues who, if you want to uh, find out more about organics, you could identify them by their label that says or, or organics, and they are both vice presidents of organics, so they can tell you anything and everything. And uh, at some point, I'd like to continue the conversation with the people here. And once more, thanks again. Sure, of course. Yeah. <coughs> And again, just thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to us. Uh, I think my final thoughts are, you know, there's so much innovation happening in Boston and in our industry. And from a company perspective, I think I am so optimistic by the trend that we're going in terms of really understanding the science, really focusing on personalized medicine, uh, really being able to work with CRO partners who are also starting to have that mindset of thinking innovatively, help us troubleshoot um, to, to be a thought partner for us. And so I think going forward as we continue to grow in this field, there's going to be more and more opportunities for us to work even more collaboratively than I think we have in the past. And so I think it's a definite opportunity for both. Uh, both sides of the uh, of the equation. Yeah, and to echo that, I think it's it's a it definitely is a changing landscape. I think um, it was, it's some really cool opportunities to leverage uh, different expertise, not just within innovator companies within the CRO network. Uh, you know, CROs are doing really cool work all, all on their own, and, and we can you know work with them to to further you know, the lives of the patients uh, through, you know, internal and external uh, work and I think in ways that we, we haven't been able to in the past. So, yeah, I think it's really cool and I think for companies like, like mine, I think it's just about being flexible and recognizing what, what, where the best place to find the right expertise is, whether it's internal or external, um, and just being able to turn on a dime, which can be difficult at a big company, but I think that's growing to be more and more important. So thank you all for, for uh, doing this, for, for answering questions, and thank you to the audience for, for your great questions, and, uh, and thanks uh, Shelley and the Mass Bio Council for putting this together. Thank you, everybody.